Chapter 7. The Digital Reich In the years after the Oklahoma City bombing, the white supremacist movement seemed to have spent most of its fury. Nothing like sea drift occurred in the late 90s. Nothing like Greensboro, either. Nazi violence, when it occurred, was mostly focused around racist skinheads and groups like the White Aryan Resistance or the Hammerskin Nation. In 1996, a group called the Aryan Republican Army robbed 22 banks in the Midwest. Several of them had ties to Elohim City, where Tim McVeigh had also tried to hide out after his attack. But these and other eruptions of violence were dealt with in short order. By the time the early 2000s rolled around and the war on terror kicked off, you could be forgiven for thinking that the white supremacist movement was on its way out. Everything You Love Will Burn by Vegas Tenhold chronicles the movement during this period. One of the largest actions in these days was an 80-man march in Toledo by the National Socialist Movement. Putting together a march of that size was the work of the entire national organization, and they were so overwhelmed by counter-protesters that they never managed to actually take to the streets. In 2010, the same group held a gathering in Trenton, New Jersey. Vegas attended to chronicle the event, and the night before the march, he was present when a group called Anti-Racist Action assaulted the Nazis as they ate dinner in a rented meeting hall. The next day, the National Socialist Movement marched. Quote, The entire route of the march was lined with National Guard and riot police. They had closed off every access point, and no one was around to watch the Nazis trudge along the wet streets while the rain soaked their black uniforms. They arrived at a wide square in front of the Capitol building. A few modest steps led up to the entrance, and a small podium stood at the top. Police had cordoned off the entire square. In the distance, the counter-protesters had gathered. The police, fearing another showdown, kept them two blocks away from the Nazis, just barely within shouting distance. So the rally was reduced to a couple dozen neo-Nazis screaming obscenities at 50 or so anti-racists down the street, while the anti-racists screamed right back. The National Socialist Movement billed itself as the direct successors to George Lincoln Rockwell's Nazi Party. In five years, they'd gone from being able to make a nationwide showing of 80 men down to less than 30. But looking at those numbers does not give us a full picture of the American fascist movement during this period. While the ability of old guard fascist groups like the NSM and the KKK to draw members had declined, the movement was deep in the process of spreading to a new generation through new means. In the last chapter, I mentioned John Ronson's Them. John's book gives us a look at the movement in the late 1990s from the perspective of individuals like Alex Jones. Mr. Jones first rose to prominence within the fringe right in the mid to late 1990s, and his career illustrates the first stages of what would grow to be known as the alt-right. On paper, Jones was a libertarian, a political independent who attacked Democrats and Republicans with equal vigor, seeing both as agents of the New World Order and the globalist elite. You would not hear any attacks on the Jews as an ethnic group from Jones, nor would you see him sporting a swastika. But if you dig in just a little bit, there have always been deep connections between Alex Jones and the fascist right. At one point in them, John tries to infiltrate a meeting of the Bilderberg Group with a writer named Big Jim Tucker. Jim Tucker was editor of The Spotlight, Willis Carto's magazine. Big Jim Tucker was also a friend and a frequent guest on Alex Jones's Infowars in its early days. Like Jones, Big Jim was obsessed with the Bilderberg Group. He viewed it as part of the Jewish conspiracy to dominate the globe. Jones professed the same beliefs, minus the J-word. That 1999 gathering at the ruins of the Branch Davidian compound near Waco, where John Ronson showed up with Randy Weaver, was framed as a volunteer effort to rebuild the Davidian church. The whole thing was organized by the then 25-year-old Alex Jones. He told the Oklahoman, quote, We've had school teachers and black single mothers and auto mechanics and doctors. There was even a Jewish rabbi out here one day helping us. Sure, we've had folks in their camo and their camo hats with the militias helping us, too. One of the men who gathered in Mount Carmel that day was Colonel Bo Gritz. Gritz was a legendary figure in the Patriot movement, a decorated veteran, the supposed inspiration behind the character Rambo, and, of course, a hardcore believer in Christian identity theology. In 1998, right before the Mount Carmel meeting, he sent this out in an online bulletin to his followers. Do you see the sign, the scent, stain, and mark of the beast on America today? Are you willing to submit and join this seed line of Satan? Look to those who are openly antichrist, who in the world is promoting abortion, pornography, pedophilia, godless laws, adultery, new age international banking, entertainment industry, and world publishing. Wherever you find perversion of God's laws, you will find the worshippers of Baal, with their roots still in Babylonian mysticism. 
New Age International Banking, Entertainment Industry, and World Publishing is a little coyer than just shouting, the Jews. But Bo was more direct in a bulletin he sent out a year later, during the 2000 election. Jews, feminists, sodomites, and other liberal activists may install gore over an apathetic moral majority. Runaway abortion, antichrist, God, and globalism are certain. Meanwhile, here's a quote from Alex Jones from John Ronson's book, Them, during that Mount Carmel gathering. The Bilderbergers, said Alex, are the Roman Senate. It's a pyramid. They're way up there. Below them, you've got the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, and you've got us down here, the cattle, the human resources, and Randy Weaver is way out over there, see? He left. They hate that, so they scare the cattle back into the pen, see? Burn them out. I'm living in a place where black helicopters, 150 miles south of me, are burning buildings, terrorizing people, and I'm an extremist? Who says you're an extremist? I asked. The Anti-Defamation League, he yelled. The ADL are a bucket of black paint and a brush. They're worse than the Klan. They get massive funding from the globalists. It doesn't matter if your girlfriend's Jewish, your little sister's Korean. Alex's little sister is Korean. Anybody who wants to live free is a racist. The ADL is the scum of the earth. What we see from Jones there is more or less the same views that he would spend years broadcasting out to millions of listeners around the world in the late 90s and early 2000s. And if you look at those views independently, Jones's beliefs look like pseudo-harmless conspiracy theorizing. But placed next to Bo Gritz, we can see Jones for what he is, a way to ease people into Christian identity-style beliefs that lead, ultimately, to exterminationist anti-Semitism. Seventeen years after that Mount Carmel meeting, I published a study with the investigative journalism collective Bellingcat on how 75 fascist activists had been initially converted or red-pilled to the cause. My research was based on leaked internal conversations where these neo-Nazis, Klansmen, and other extremists discussed their ideological evolution. Six of them credited Alex Jones with their red-pilling. They even had a name for it, taking the conspiracy pill. There was an explicit understanding that interest in wacky conspiracy theories could, gradually, make people more willing to accept neo-Nazi attitudes towards the Jewish question. One user wrote, I don't give a fuck if you think it, it being the secret rulers of the world, are aliens or not, as long as those aliens are Jewish at the end of the day. For those of us who grew up online in the early aughts, the last five years or so have been a continuous, dispiriting process of watching outright fascist beliefs bubble up on places like Reddit and 4chan. It seems as if Nazis have literally eaten the internet we all knew and loved as kids. This did not happen by accident. Alex Jones is just one prong of a concerted digital power grab that began before most of us even knew the internet existed. Alex Jones is just one prong of a concerted digital digital power grab that began before most of us even knew the internet existed. In 1984, Lewis Beam used money he'd received from Robert Matthews's order to create LibertyNet, an international network of code word accessed message boards. The goal of LibertyNet was to link the white power movement together. It was used to spread recruitment materials, and its establishment allowed the movement to switch tactics quickly, as was seen after Estes Park. It also included personal ads for and pen pal programs, which could be as innocuous as connecting racists for social purposes, but was also useful for planning crimes. The internet allowed Beam to send racist propaganda into places where it was illegal, like Canada and Germany. After setting up LibertyNet, Beam wrote, Finally, we are all going to be linked together at one point in time. Imagine, if you will, all the great minds of the patriotic Christian movement linked together and joined to one computer. Imagine any patriot in the country being able to call up and access these minds. You are online with the Aryan Nation's brain trust. It is here to serve the folk. It has been said that knowledge is power, which it most assuredly is. The computer offers, to those who become proficient in its use, power undreamed of by the rulers of the past. Computers were not cheap in the mid-1980s. Beam's work required the modern equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars in seed money. A single Apple computer cost roughly $2,000 at the time. Without the order, none of this would have been possible. And while law enforcement was diligent about trying to track down all the rocket launchers and machine guns and explosives bought with the order's ill-gotten gains, they barely seemed to notice the computer equipment Beam had bought and spread around the nation. After all, why would the 1980s FBI care if some Apple IIs wound up gifted to various Nazis around the nation? Ignoring this would prove to be a tremendous error in judgment. By 1995, slightly over a decade later, Nazi efforts online had crystallized into a cohesive and effective digital Reich. Fascists were some of the first people to effectively harness the power of the internet in an organized way. The book Nation and Race, edited by Jeffrey Kaplan and Tor Bjorgo, includes a chapter that delves into the state of the online white supremacist movement at this time. 
The book cites Walter Benjamin, a scholar who wrote an essay about how new technology, like photography, was harnessed by the original Nazis. Quote, Mass movements are usually discerned more clearly by a camera than by the naked eye. A bird's eye view best captures gatherings of hundreds of thousands, and even though such a view may be accessible to the human eye as it is to the camera, the image received by the eye cannot be enlarged the way a negative is enlarged. While photographs in a film best captured the character of the original Nazi movement, its modern descendant is best captured online, in countless conversations and debates across message boards, image boards, YouTube comment sections, and the like. In the wake of the Oklahoma City bombing, and in response to the effectiveness with which anti-racist street movements like Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice shut down fascist street gatherings, the internet became increasingly central to the development of American fascism. In the early 1990s, Milton John Klein Jr. was a 25-year-old studying at St. Cloud University. His school provided him with a free Usenet account, and one of his professors rather accidentally gave him the listing where he came upon Alt.Skinheads, a neo-Nazi newsgroup. Milton was one of the first young men to become radicalized into fascism through the internet. He grew obsessed, spending hours a day writing thousands of newsgroup posts and emails. He became a coordinator for several digitally inclined fascists. Klein graduated in 1995, and shortly thereafter, he had his first real face-to-face -face encounter with a member of the movement, Lynn Young, William Pierce's secretary. She gave Klein a check for $500, which he used to buy a computer to continue his work now that he was no longer at the university. Klein may never again have met another Nazi in person, but he continued his activities, and later that year wrote an essay on digital strategy that he posted to the Aryan Crusaders Library website. In it, he wrote that the internet, quote, offers enormous opportunity for the Aryan resistance to disseminate our message to the unaware and the ignorant. It is the only relatively uncensored, so far, free forum mass medium which we have available. The state cannot yet stop us from advertising our ideas and organizations. Now is the time to grasp the weapon which is the net and wield it skillfully and wisely while you may still do so freely. In the mid-1990s, Usenet, an early predecessor to modern forum culture, was where most online discussions occurred. The most critical Nazi destinations had names like alt.nationalism.white, alt.revolution.counter, alt.skinhead, and, as a prelude to 8chan's poll board, alt.politics. This was all very much in line with the ideas Beam had laid out a decade earlier. But Klein wanted to see his fellow fascists move out from their digital safe spaces, become cyber guerrillas, and, quote, Take up positions on mainstream groups. Except on our groups, avoid the race issue. Sidestep it as much as possible. We don't have time to defend our stance on this issue against the comments of hundreds of fools, liars, and degenerates who, spouting the Jewish line, will slaughter our message with half-truths, slander, and the ever-used sophistry. Klein's writing is particularly fascinating to me for the similarities I see between it and things I've encountered in my own exploration of the modern online Nazi haven 8chan. Near the end of his essay, Klein writes... All of my comrades and I, none of whom have ever met face to face, share a unique camaraderie, feeling as though we have been friends for a long time. Selfless cooperation occurs regularly amongst my comrades for a variety of endeavors. This feeling of comradeship is irrespective of national identity or state borders. Now that's not so different from what Poway synagogue shooter John Ernest related in the 8chan post he made announcing the start of his rampage. It's been real, dudes. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything. Keep up the infographic red pill threads. I've only been lurking for a year and a half, yet what I've learned here is priceless. It's been an honor. Klein's last line about feeling comradeship across national lines would also prove to be an eerie premonition of the future of the international fascist movement. Because during the late 1990s and early 2000s, the American fascist movement went international in a way it really never had been before. Even back in the 1930s and 40s, Italian, German, and Spanish fascism were all very different beasts. One side effect of the propaganda that started emanating out of the United States as a result of Beam's Liberty Net was that all of the world's sundry fascists started getting on the same page. I found a 2002 study by Les Black, published in the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies. Les interviewed an Irish fascist with the handle White Wolf. Quote, During the height of his involvement in the movement, he was spending five hours a day online. He lives in an Irish town where there are virtually no visible minorities. He was drawn to the white power movement through a fascination with Nazism. 
He concluded, mostly Americans are on the net, but there are British, Irish, and lots of others from different countries. The net breaks down the distance. A person who was living on a 2,000-acre farm in Australia and had nobody to talk about his views suddenly understands that he can link with people he would never have met, can talk with them, plan with them, learn and teach one another things, help each other. Our Aussie friend, who may well be removed from the rest of his comrades, can nevertheless play a role in forwarding the agenda of a group. Racists love the internet. Seventeen years later, a young man who might very well have been that Aussie friend, Brenton Tarrant, drove to a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, and gunned down more than 50 people. Like White Wolf, Brenton was a loner, spending hours a day online, building a sense of rapport with his far-flung digital comrades in fascism before finally deciding to take action. The thing that really shocked me when I started digging into this research was how damn groundbreaking the fascists were in their understanding of what online culture would become and how to manipulate it. I'm going to quote from Nation and Race again. This arena has spawned its own language and combines previous forms of right-wing organizing with the new political strategies. CNG, variously referred to as the Cyber Nationalist Group, Cyber Nazi Group, or Computer Nationalist Group, is the brainchild of activist Jeff Voss. In his article entitled The CNG, An Idea for Online Organization, a complete division of labor is outlined that assigns operatives particular roles within an overall strategy. Voss makes a distinction between idea men and men of action. The former provide background information for the latter to post within and Usenet. The manifesto outlines four types of underground operative. A disseminator, or a subtle disseminator of information, who places it on FTP sites and makes subtle reference to endorsements such as info on news, usually pretending to be a disinterested observer. A pirate, a person who will pirate an account for one-shot high-saturation dissemination of propaganda. An impersonator, who impersonates the enemy posting, embarrassing the left and infuriating the public. And an infiltrator, who infiltrates the enemy camp. Fascists were some of the first folks to develop a cohesive strategy around flaming. As early as the 1995, researchers into online extremism had realized that a common endpoint used by right-wing activists is the stylized disclaimer, I am not a Nazi. Those same researchers also noted the use of mail bombs or software that allowed fascists to deluge a recipient in hundreds upon hundreds of pieces of spam email in order to make an opponent's account functionally unusable. 21 years later, when I wrote an article critical of 8chan in the lead-up to the 2016 election, my work account was deluged in spam emails. Wyatt Kaldenberg was an internet activist affiliated with Tom Metzger's White Aryan Resistance, or WAR. We even talked about Metzger or WAR much in this audiobook. I had to limit my focus somewhere. But Tom was a major part of the Nazi skinhead movement, as well as an associate of the Order. Back in the 1970s, he worked with David Duke to help organize his clan Border Watch. Wyatt helped spread war's message online, and gained infamy as one of the first proponents of what would come to be known as brigading, disrupting other online communities in an organized way. Wyatt wrote, This ought to be our new tactic. Instead of hanging around the four racist news groups, we can hit news groups as a mob. We cannot win when we are outnumbered by Jews, but if we go in as a group, we can win with the average Joe six-pack. Post fact about black crime. Give them your update numbers, web addresses, push books, newspapers. Fascist groups like the Carolinian Lords of the Caucasus started going into news groups dedicated to loneliness and people who had just ended relationships. They also traveled into news groups for popular musicians, even the news group for Denny's, which might as well have been a support group for lonely people. Raids like this were often just for the purpose of harassment. But over the years, fascists got better and better at spreading their ideology through these places. They quickly hit upon the tactic of hiding their beliefs as humor retreating behind the shield of, we're just joking, when people responded badly to their rants about Jewish people or black-on-white crime. Christian identity theology also spread online in this period. I found an article in the Journal of Black Studies written by Tanya Sharp in 2000. She noted, The internet has become a primary means for disseminating information for these groups. Currently, there are 25 websites and 13 news groups specifically devoted to identity Christianity on the World Wide Web, as well as 130 other websites that are devoted to similar and related topics. Individuals can tap into these websites and find procedures for making bombs, obtain hate propaganda tracts, and request catalogs that market white supremacist books and paraphernalia. They may also share Jew, Get Black, Gay, Asian, and Hispanic bashing sessions with like-minded individuals in chat rooms. Bit by bit, and almost entirely in a decentralized manner, the digital right came together in the early 2000s. Law enforcement was not just helpless to do anything. It's debatable whether or not they even realized what was really happening. Most of their online efforts were spent keeping track of known quantities with long-standing online ties, like Don Black and his popular fascist website, Stormfront. 
Now, Stormfront is certainly important. Nearly 100 hate crime murders have been traced to members of the site, but the FBI wasn't even particularly good at monitoring Stormfront. In July of 2019, in response to a FOIA request, the Bureau admitted that they had somehow lost virtually all of their files on the website. So if the FBI only did a quarter-ass job of monitoring the most obvious Nazis online, it's probably not surprising that they completely failed to notice when fascists started infiltrating communities on websites like 4chan and Reddit. It happened slowly, camouflaged in irony and humor. As a young man, I was only vaguely aware of the changes taking place in the digital spaces I'd grown up around. Holocaust jokes grew more common, and so did racist humor. Maybe more than just growing more frequent, these jokes also grew more specific, evolving from jibes about Jewish people being stingy with money and black people hating camping, to memes about how Hitler did nothing wrong and image macros that repeated bad science about race and IQ. In a 2018 article I found on The Observer, Holocaust scholar Timothy Snyder commented on the use of irony and humor by fascists to mainstream their views. What 21st century culture has introduced is that nothing really is serious. And that is an interestingly dangerous idea, because if nothing is serious, you can have this ambiguity where you could actually be doing something very serious, but you're pretending not to, and you can always fall back and say, well, this was just a joke, because everything is just a joke. But of course, you don't really believe that everything is just a joke, or you wouldn't be promoting fascism or white supremacy or whatever it may be. And then, in 2014, things rather suddenly boiled over into the cultural phenomenon known as Gamergate. On its surface, Gamergate was a reaction to corruption in video games journalism. In reality, it was an eruption of white and male supremacist hatred, an attack on modernity and liberalism by an army of young men who believed they'd been wronged by society. There has not yet been a great deal of research into whether or not there was an organized attempt by the white power movement to co-opt Gamergate, but there is ample evidence that the ideas of that movement quickly made it into popular memes spread by Gamergaters. During my research, I came across a thread on the website Reset Era, filled with other confused digital natives trying to figure out just what the fuck had happened with Gamergate. One user posted a series of memes he'd saved during that time. In retrospect, they seem to show a progressive descent into white nationalism. The first is a propaganda poster featuring a cartoon mascot of 4chan's poll board, Polina, advising the Anons of poll on how to effectively aid the movement. Polina is blonde-haired and blue-eyed. At the top of the poster are the words, Who is that girl? Blonde-haired, blue eyes, fair skin. Why? It must be Polina. Another meme from further on in the collection is significantly Nazier. It's based around an old labor movement political cartoon pyramid of a modern capitalist system, showing labors on the very bottom being exploited by the classes above them. In the Gamergate adaptation, gamers are the bottom of the pyramid, with games journalists above them, critical theorist social justice warriors like Anita Sarkeesian above them, cultural Marxist academia above them, and then FAFSA loans atop, represented by an Illuminati I symbol. We don't see much explicit anti-Semitism in this cartoon, but it is there both in the references to cultural Marxism and in the caricatured drawings of Jewish video game critics. It's clear at this point that some of the old white power talking points had started to mutate to better appeal to modern and extremely online youth. Eventually, the harassment of video game journalists and critics, most of whom were women, grew severe and illegal enough that 4chan exiled its gamergators. Many of them migrated to 8chan, and over the next several years, they grew more radical and more explicitly fascist, until, eventually, they were openly planning for how to create a new holocaust. It's impossible to know how much of the ironic fascist shitposting started off innocently and how much of it was seeded by white power activists, but we know they were engaging in that behavior purposefully for more than 20 years, and in the years after Gamergate, their work has paid dividends. The true danger of the Digital Reich was best expressed by Alex Curtis, the publisher of an extremist neo-Nazi magazine and self-proclaimed lone wolf of hate. In the early 2000s, he wrote of his hope that, some well-placed Aryans will one day cause some serious wreckage. A thousand Timothy McVeighs would end any semblance of stability in this racially corrupt society. We have not yet reached the point where there are a thousand Timothy McVeighs, but we have seen a market increase in the amount of right-wing domestic terror over the last several years, and it certainly seems to be driven largely by online radicalization. Robert Bowers, the Tree of Life synagogue shooter, was radicalized in part on Gab, a social network for Nazis. He announced the start of his rampage there. Six months later, the Poway synagogue shooter announced the start of his rampage on 8chan, as had the Christchurch shooter six weeks prior. There are other names on this roll call of internet-inspired fascist violence. 
The Adam Waffen terrorist group, responsible for three murders so far, started off with extremely online Nazis working to form a terror cell in imitation of the book Siege, written by James Mason. We talked briefly about Mason and Siege at the start of this book. He was a student of William Pierce, and Siege might best be understood as a more academic accompanying text to the Turner Diaries. What the diaries propose as fiction, Siege outlines in strategic depth. Mason advocates for leaderless resistance and lone wolf-style attacks. Quote, The lone wolf cannot be detected, cannot be prevented, and seldom can be traced. If I were asked by anyone my opinion on what to look for or hope for next, I would tell them a wave of killings or assassinations of system bureaucrats by roving gunmen who have their strategy well mapped out in advance and well and nigh impossible to stop. In early 2019, Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Hassan was caught planning this exact sort of attack. He had a cache of weapons and ammo and a kill list of journalists and Democratic politicians. Hassan was obsessed with the manifesto of Anders Breivik, a far-right shooter who murdered dozens of students in Utøya, Norway. We don't know where he first came into contact with that manifesto, but spreading it has been a priority of online fascists for years. In the wake of the Christchurch shooting, they've started spreading Brenton Tarrant's manifesto as well. The Poway synagogue shooter cited both manifestos as major inspirations for his attack. In his, own rampage, in his own rampage thread on 8chan, the Poway shooter stated his desire to beat Terrence high score. In this, we see echoes of Eric Harris, the Columbine shooter who is obsessed with beating Timothy McVeigh's high score. Right now, as I read this, violent armed young men in, on 8chan's poll board and in numerous Discord chat rooms around the country are plotting for ways they might beat their heroes and win a high score of their own. On Telegram, the Bowl Patrol, a group of young fascists dedicated to Charleston shooter Dylan Roof, celebrate St. Roof and fantasize about new acts of violence in his name. The yearly harvest and blood these young men will reap was sown by Lewis Beam, William Pierce, and Bob Matthews. Now there is no need for an organization to buy up arms and plan terror attacks. The order proved less resilient than the completely decentralized radicalization and killing machine made possible by the advent of the World Wide Web. The internet has given the white power movement a steady supply of armed and ready young killers, living cruise missiles, who strike unpredictably at targets across the country. Bit by bit, their attacks chisel away at our sense of security, our national stability, and our trust in each other. It took decades but Louis Beam and his comrades did bring the war home to all of us and against all of us.